Welcome to the Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting for August 12th, 2013. I ask the town clerk to take the roll call. Chairman Walsh. Here. Councilor Guvinelli. Here. Councilor Jordan. Councilor Ray. Here. Councilor Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor Wagner. Here. In the nick of time. I, that, was, that was great, Jamie. I, we, we, we planned that, actually, if you want. Good. Yeah, that's great. Good. Okay, if you'd all rise, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. There may be a bit of an echo in the room because we had carpeting removed today, which was supposed to happen tomorrow, but uh, better late than ever, I guess. It's gone. And it uh, looks like the gymnasium floor here uh, uh, from uh, a long time ago. But, but it actually sounds easier to hear than it usually does in this room, so yeah. at least I hope so. Good. Any, any memories from this floor, from those of you who went to high school in this building? <laughs> no, no comment. No, no. Okay, let's move to the first item on the agenda, Town Council uh, reports and correspondence. Is there any Town Council? Yes, Jessica. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'd like to report that um, the Library Planning Committee will be holding a roundtable discussion on the future of the Thomas Memorial Library on Thursday, August 29th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. in the high school cafeteria. And this is part of our charge by the Council to have this to have a public outreach event. So that's what this is. So we're hoping that many, many people come and let us know what their thoughts are. And the date, Jessica, is the 20th? Thursday, August 29. From what time? From 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the high school cafeteria. That's great. Thank you. There will, there will be notices coming in the courier and on the website and mm -hmm. cable access TV and around town. So. Great. And for other counselors, I know that um, looking at the communication plan that I read from Molly, your chair, they were looking to us to possibly lead some discussion or be helpful in the facilitation of that evening's yes. event. Yes, yes, you, you'll be getting a formal request for members from the council and also the school board to help as, as facilitators for the roundtable discussions that night. Okay, great, thank you very much, that's great. Are there any other town council reports or correspondence? Yes, David. Uh, the town center planning committee uh, met today at 4 p.m. Uh, and we are excited next week. We're actually going to have a joint meeting with the library committee to discuss how the goals of those two committees <coughs> might interact and how we might each be able to help the other out. Uh, so we will have that meeting uh, Monday, August 19th at 4 p.m. in the town hall. Uh, and that the town center committee is moving forward uh, and we actually had a really productive meeting today. We are in, 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 in now attempting to plan a public workshop where we can get feedback from the public regarding the direction of, the, of our committee and the town center generally. Great. I was um, enthused to read the brainstorming session or the recap yeah. of the brainstorming session that you folks had. Um, and I, I think that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I mean, that was sort of kind of out of the box in some ways, but it was also uh, good to sort of capture it all. So, um, you know, I don't know. Are those minutes on the website for yes. others to read? Mm -hmm. They are. Good. It, uh, it, it looks like some, some good enthusiasm around that. Any other town council reports or correspondence? Yes, Jessica? Well, I, I'm sure that we'll probably all chime in. But for those of us who were able to be at the Beach to Beacon, um, I was again reminded of what an outstanding event it is and how incredibly well organized and supported. And I'm sure, I, I know some of you are also there, so I, I'd like to just mention that, and I'm sure some other folks here would like to add Great. to that. It, David? it was incredible. Uh, yeah, I just want to echo Jessica's comments. It is really amazing <clears throat> to uh, see what is happening in, in this town early in the morning on the day of the Beach to Beacon. I was riding my bike to the starting line, uh, sort of moaning and groaning internally. Why am I doing this race again? My knee hurts, my back hurts, I'm getting too old. 
Uh, but <clears throat> there I was, and as I was driving down Shore Road and then 77, you just see everybody that lives along that stretch getting out, getting their chairs out, setting up their loudspeakers, getting the music ready. There's just so much enthusiasm uh, in this town, and it's really not just that day, of course. It's, it's months in the works in terms of planning, and I just, again, want to, and I sent this in an email to uh, our town manager earlier, but uh, the, the police and fire departments, public works departments, all the, all the energy and work they put into the event is a huge factor in its success, as well, of course, as the uh, citizens of our town who, like me, run in it, but also, more importantly, the folks who volunteer. It is just a great event for our town. So thank you to all of those folks responsible for another successful race in our town. And thank you, David, for serving on the, I guess that's the, what, the, the board of directors for, for the Beach Beacon. Well, so. It's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments? Kathy? Yes. Um, personally, I would like to say that um, it was exciting because my daughter ran it for the second time, and she bettered her time by 15 seconds. But um, <laughs> I, I just want to say thank you to the town um, <clears throat> folks because they do a fabulous job at dealing with 6,500 people. And I live near the start line, and it is a challenge. And um, the town does a wonderful job. They come with the little cones, and they take the little cones away. And, um, you know, the, the townspeople and the people who pay taxes have to be um, thanked because, you know, a lot of people put up with some interesting um, challenges. And, and I'm not saying that in a, a derogatory way, but you know, I'm saying thank you very much because I think people support the race and they're happy to, you know, have it. Um, but they also say, you know, let's, mm. let's help out and, you know, put up with a few things, and, and they do. So, anyway, thank you very much to the town. I really appreciate the town's work. Good. Any other comments? Um, we have, um, on behalf of the town council, I've sent thank you notes to all of the department heads and their staffs for the outstanding work and time and energy that they've put into putting this together and representing our community in the way they have. And uh, uh, personally, my mother lives in Falmouth, Massachusetts, and she has recovered from the 12,500 runners in that town yesterday. But one, mm -hmm. one comment my mother did make to me uh, was the fact that Joni Benoit had uh, spoken um, at, the, um, at one of the events in Falmouth and talked about how great this race uh, was here in Portland, Maine, and she just, uh, Cape Elizabeth can't be, in her opinion, can't be higher on the list. So it's kind of nice to have that connection with Joni and the two races. So, but thank you. Okay, let's uh, move on to Finance Committee report. Anything, Frank? Um, nothing to report beyond the fact that we're working on the CIP. Uh, as Mike will be discussing this evening, uh, I'll be getting together with the chair of the uh, Finance Committee of the School Board and be working on this so we can have a report to the respective uh, committees in the near future. Great. Thank you. Uh, Michael, anything to add on that or just get, we'll get to the no, we'll get to it component? Right okay, Done. great. Okay, we have the first uh, citizen's opportunity for discussion of items that are not on today's agenda. Are there any citizens who wish to address the council? If so, please step forward to the podium. Seeing none, we'll move to the town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. I, I wanted to join the councillors in thanking everyone for the, the Beach to Beacon efforts. Um, I was at the fire, depart, fire station that morning before anything started. <coughs> I, I asked the fire chief how many people are, are in this room, if they're in the, the big meeting room there. And there were 70 of our own folks, either volunteer firemen, rescue members, and the fire police unit. In addition to that, there were 70 from approximately 70 from other communities as well. So when you think of, you know, it's not, we couldn't, we all, we couldn't do it with all of our folks, but we also couldn't do it with the support of, of the other communities, and, and I think that, that is important to mention. Uh, the other thing I did want to mention about the race is that Dave Weatherby uh, has been the president of the, the Beach to Beacon organization for the last 16 years, and he's staying on the board, but he's stepping down as the president, and David has been excellent to work with over many, many years, and, uh, he also sent an email today uh, expressing his appreciation for the support that the community gives to the race. And uh, anyway, he's, he's still going to be part of the race, but I did want to particularly note uh, his support of it, as well as, you know, all the individuals in, in the town who, who pulled together to, 
to, to uh, get this all done. I, uh, the, the town manager's report, by the way, is on, a, if you look at the agenda, it is on the link, uh, and you can access it that way. Uh, did want to mention, congratulate Paul Fenton, uh, who's our police detective, <coughs> who's being promoted to police sergeant, effective in about a week. Uh, Paul's been with the police department since 1997, and he's taking Andy Steindl's place, who uh, retired uh, a month or so ago. I uh, want to make mention, Bruce Kempton uh, passed away last week. Bruce uh, was worked with Bob for many, many years. Uh, he was the, originally started off in, in the early 70s in the Department of Public Works as, as one of the heavy equipment operators. And then when the position opened up for the first time, they, they created a position of parks foreman or someone initially to be in charge of Fort Williams Park, the mowing, to oversee the summer crew and all that. And, and Bruce was promoted to that position and, you know, really helped to set the stage of moving and, you know, making, you know, the lawns and the other things so much better looking and, uh, than they had been in, in the past. And uh, really did a great job of supervising a, a lot of people who were once kids and uh, now, we're, now we're quite a bit older. I think probably some of the kids are working for us uh, at, at this point. But uh, af even after he retired, he came back and helped out part-time at the Recycling Center for about five years. So anyway, Bruce was uh, a, a wonderful person to work with. And you know, I know uh, those, those that worked with him in Public Works uh, really, feel, really feel his loss. Uh, on, on a totally different note, uh, everyone should be looking for their tax bills this week. Uh, Deborah Lane and Matt Sturgis have been working on that, and the I, I guess the, the bills have been posted. They're working on it today. They're working on it today. Working on it today. Tomorrow, so. uh, today, tomorrow. So anyway, yeah, everyone should be looking in their mail, and if you don't get one, you know, feel free to call and ask for one. Uh, we'd be happy to. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Michael. I can we'd, see we'd be happy to. Very enthusiastic. Well, you know, I, I say that in, in a little bit of you know <laughs> jest, but but we also have individuals who who bought a property or whatever and uh, when we didn't get the address we didn't get some change and the, there are people that complain that they didn't get their bill and look for adjustments as a result and so again I really want to encourage everyone to be looking out for their tax bill. Uh, the annual audits are nearly complete I want to thank everyone who's been involved in that I know Frank I believe met with with Jen Connors a representative of the auditing firm representing the council is, is one of the traditions and the, the, we do have the numbers yet. We don't have the final report. There's a, there's a little bit of possible change of receivables and sewer, just because nothing, no big deal, just they haven't got the final report from the water district yet. But anyway, our unassigned fund balance increased by $201,000 in the general fund, so we had, a, we had a positive outcome for the year. Uh, this is the time of year we also look at all of our annual statistics, and I did want to make mention that for the year ended June 30, there were three new single-family homes built in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, seven condominiums, but only three single-family homes. And you know, and we, I've only got records going back, you know, about 30 years, uh, you know, that have kept track of that statistic. But then, you, I know before then, because people were complaining about growth, that there were a lot, you go back to the, the World War II period, you know, they built whole neighborhoods uh, then. So, you know, it, it's my guess, you know, maybe there was some time during the Depression that they only built that number of houses. But you know, before that, you had a lot of homes built in Cape Cottage Woods and in that area. So it's got to be at least 100 years since we've had that few single-family homes built in Cape Elizabeth. So for, for those that have wanted to control growth and have been concerned about growth, uh, I, I, three new single-family homes. Uh, I want to mention the sidewalk on Shore Road uh, is under construction. They began paving there today. The section between Surf Road and Cottage uh, sort of laying out where the curb is going to go. Did they pave the actual sidewalk yet? Um, did the first layer. Excuse me? The first layer. They did the first layer. Uh, so that's progressing and they'll be moving up to between the two Ford entrances uh, okay. later this week. Yeah. Uh, did want to mention our annual employee training and recognition day is this Thursday. Uh, we'll be treating the employees to lunch at the Snow Squall. On Thursday during the morning, we'll be having training in, in various areas of catch up. Uh, the, the town hall and the library will be closed that day, but again, want to express appreciation to all the employees <coughs> for all that they do, and, and particularly to thank uh, Pat Fowler, who, who has done 
a lot of the organization work for the event itself and thank Deb for all of her work and the recognition materials and, and getting that ready. I know Jim is going to be helping to present some recognitions uh, when we get together on Thursday. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention, the Charles Road Sewer Project Board has been working hard on that and it's all wrapped up except for the final paving and we expect that done the 27th supposedly. Yeah, but those dates tend to have a way of being uh, flex flexible. So it's supposed to be paved the 27th, so that'd be good to get done. So thank you, Jim. And Michael, what's happening in here? This is a good point. As some of you may have noticed that there's no longer any carpet here. Uh, tomorrow, this dais is going to be removed after 35 years. Uh, there's some tables you see over here on the right. Uh, those are going to be in this approximate position. There's going to be new carpet put down. It's going to be a, a total new look and feel of this room. And, uh, you know, I think what it's really going to do is, is two things. It's going to make this room a lot more friendly, back and forth, and, but particularly it's going to make it a lot more flexible. Because while there be three tables usually set up, you might note that there's six tables there. And so that way, this room will be, you know, right now where it's, people don't want to use it because they don't like the formality of this, it's going to be able to be available for all sorts of meetings, for all sorts of groups during the day, in the evening. And, you know, I think it's just a much, in the end, it's going to be a much better resource use of this space. It is going to be a little controversial. Uh, at the beginning, and people are going to take a little getting used to the fact that it's a little less formal, <coughs> it's uh, all on one level, uh, but it is going to create a lot more space because you don't have to have the, the, the ramp, it's going to be a lot more accessible, and in the end, you know, the sense is it's going to have a much more feel of, of more open dialogue and less authoritarian with a podium. So I hope everyone's patient with it. The other good news is, is that these are all on wheels. Uh, so other than the fact that we'll have to have some plugs underneath to, to do it, they're, they're very movable, it's a lot easier than the custodians, uh, and it's, it's an awful lot easier in getting the meetings and things set up the way you want it, uh, as opposed to really being stuck with a certain way because of this being so fastened to the ground. So, Any question, uh, questions? No. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, Greg Marles is coordinating. The, yes, tomorrow we've got, this is being torn out where we're now sitting and there's electricians coming in, and uh, I forget who else, but uh, it could be noisy in here tomorrow. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the draft minutes of July 8th and July 30th. Uh, can I take a motion on either individually or both together? Kathy? I move that we accept both the minutes from, oh, my pad went out. Um, July 8th and July 30th, 2013. I have a second. Jessica, second. Um, actually, I have a point of information, uh, or perhaps a point of order. I was okay. absent for the July council meeting. I was ill. Mm -hmm. And I, my understanding is I cannot vote on those minutes because I wasn't present. So I would request, I was present for the July 30th meeting. So I would request that these that be, they be done separately. Yes, okay. please. Well, I'll Kathy, would you mind? Nope, I will. Um, I move that we accept the July 8th, 2013 minutes. Seconded. Second. Seconded by David. All those in favor? So that was five. All and, those. And I abstain. You're abstaining. Yes. So there's okay. five, zero. Kathy, for this. Um, I move that we accept the minutes of the July 30th, 2013 meeting. Seconded. I'll second that. Second that. Thank you. All those in favor? Six. All those opposed? Zero. Thank you very much. Moving on to item 104. We entertain a motion. This is the Ocean House Pizza Malt Venus Renewal Application. Kathy? Well, go ahead. Um, I move that we accept um, the application for Ocean House Pizza Malt and Venus, I never say it right, renewal application. Seconded. David? I'll second. Seconded. Is there any discussion? Is the applicant here who wishes to address us? No? She's here. Yes. She's here. Did you want to address us in any way? No? Uh. Okay. All right. Hearing no discussion, uh, we'll move the question. All those in favor? Six. All those opposed? Six, zero. Thank you. Item 98. Chair will entertain a motion. 
Jessica? I move that we remove item nine, number 98 from the table. I, it looks like that's the first motion the that first, needs to take yes. place. Oh, I'll second that. I'll, any discussion about removing it from the table, which was from our previous meeting? Seeing no discussion. Yes, Jay, yeah. question? Is the intent of removing it from the table to have further discussion on it and then decide whether or not we're going to vote on it today or are we going to be, is, is that the goal? The, yeah. I, the goal is to put it on tonight's Yes, my understanding of yes. you remove it from the table because as long as it's on the table, it cannot be a, a matter of discussion in any way. That's my understanding. Okay. Right. Michael, is that true? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have it first and seconded. Is any other discussion about removing it from the table? All those in favor? 6-0. Now we'll move to item number 98. Chair will entertain a motion. David. Uh, I move that the council approve the proposed rules and regulations for the vending of expressive matter at Fort Williams Park, the draft of which is in our materials. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, I look to the council at this point. I would like to see if anyone in the audience wishes to address the council on this item, if, if it's the will of the group, or I can wait for discussion. Is it okay? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the council at this time? Please come forward at the podium and please give us your name and address. Thank you. We'll limit the, limit the discussion to about three minutes. But I don't see a whole lot of folks behind you, so we're certainly willing to listen to what you have to say. Um, my name is Marilyn Christensen. I live at 40 L.Y. Pole Road. And um, my husband, Chris, is the artist who's setting up in Fort Wayne. <clears throat> the town has a large agenda tonight, so I'll try to be brief. Better? Thank you. <laughs> the town has a large agenda tonight, so I will try to be brief and will speak for both myself and Chris. Since the proposed rules first appeared in June, we have attended all the meetings and the site walk, and the town has listened to all our comments and complaints. The rules before you tonight are virtually the same as the original, so I will summarize the main reasons we feel they still infringe First Amendment rights. Over the last few years, the town has actively sought to add to its commercial activities in the Lighthouse Circle to help defray park costs. They have discussed and accepted that each new venture will inevitably impact the natural beauty of the location to some degree. Now that one independent artist has appeared, the rules seek to remove him from the same area on the grounds of preserving pristine beauty and protecting the park from excessive commercialism. Constitutional guidelines for restricting First Amendment rights only allow time and place rules when the scale of the problem becomes an issue that can't be resolved without rules. With currently one artist, the town's rules are overreaching and premature. The same guidelines are very clear that time and place restrictions are only acceptable if ample alternative unregulated locations are available. The town rules specifically forbid any other artist locations. The proposed site for artists has considerable health and safety issues in its present condition. The penalty section of the rules seeks to discriminate against artists and talks of removing their First Amendment rights completely by calling them a privilege and barring the artist from the park. I have read the miscellaneous offensive, offenses ordinance and can find no, no other section where the general public is subject to similar partial or permanent expulsions. Finally, we were pleased to read in the paper that the American Civil Liberties Union might offer their expert guidance. We feel a second independent legal review of the rules will help to ensure they are fair and just for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Let's step to the floor. Okay. <laughs> Is uh, anyone else wish to address us? Seeing none, move back to the council for discussion. Um, Michael, I'd ask you um, briefly if Michael could just address, we had some minor changes that we, at our workshop, that needed to be addressed in the, in the rules, and I wondered if you might be able to just comment briefly. I know one of them was in the penalties section. Yeah, I just wanted to, to be clear that since the council received its last draft a month ago, when you received the draft of this meeting about a week ago from the town attorney, the only area that's been changed from the earlier draft is to have the penalty provision clearer uh, 
so that it is, it is understood how it's in conformance with the overall miscellaneous offenses ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions, uh, Jamie? It's an initial question. Since I wasn't able to be at the, the site uh, visit for the rest of you were at, um, I wanted to know what the council, the, the sense of the council was regarding the, uh, how suitable that site was. Go ahead, Jessica. Well, I, yeah, I was present and <clears throat> present as the rest of us were. I think it's, I think it's the most suitable site given all the factors of the needs of the fort and given the factor, the needs of prospective artists. Um, I thought it was the most reasonable, the most visible. Um, and so I'm, I'm very pleased to support it. Any other comments from other, Frank? Uh, I would say the, the site that, <coughs> that were considered all seem to me to be very reasonable. Um, I guess I, I, I lean towards the area that against the wall closer to the house because it seems less uh, obvious. <coughs> I would sell something. I think the site that's going to be is the best site. It's right there. The park that you drive in. And, um, and while you know, there are some uh, issues with it, perhaps it's pretty flat, and I think it's very accessible to uh, visitors to the park. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I just would echo the comments of Jessica and Frank uh, of the sites we considered. Um, I, I understood where Frank was coming from. I didn't like that site just because of its proximity to the uh, porta potties. And also, I understand drainage would be a challenge there from speaking with Bob Malley, our public works director. So, I thought the site that's been proposed in these regulations was the best site. Uh, and I also thought it would uh, it'd certainly generate a lot of foot traffic by that site. It, it, it's not as if we're placing artists or anybody intending to sell their works of expression. Uh, it's not as if we're placing them in, in an area where they would never see any visitors. To the contrary, that's where all of the visitors who park to see the lighthouse would walk by as they go to the lighthouse, mm -hmm. except for the few limited uh, handicap spots that are right next to the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kathy? Um, I concur with the other uh, three folks. Um, having visited um, the, the proposed spot, I thought was the best. And I think the thing that was um, important to me was that um, Mike indicated that, you know, if there was concerns about levelness or whatever, that the town would work with whomever to make sure that it was flat enough and there was access from um, uh, wheelchairs or whatever. Um, it's right next to the parking lot. And as people come down over the hill as they're heading for the lighthouse, first thing they're going to see is, you know, artists set up there or whomever set up there. Uh, dancers or whatever. And so they come down the hill, they're supposed to park in the parking lot, so their first access is going to be the folks that are there. So um, I did not think it was unreasonable, and I thought that the, um, the group did a really thorough job at suggesting that. So that, that was my preference. And again, I'll just echo the, the comments from those folks who were at the, at the walk. Um, the additional comments about trying to, to prepare it a little bit in terms of leveling it off or whatever. Those were all nice additions, frankly, to the conversation. A lot of discussion about the place Frank was talking about, but it, it, it's got a, some drainage issues that are a little more substantial in terms of trying to get it right. But I think that uh, the location is clearly visible by, by all as you come down that hill. Um, Jamie, had you gone out there to take a look? Did you have any thoughts about the three spots? Or I mean, you may not have known about the other two, but at least the one that we're proposing. Yeah, I, I know that area quite well, so it seems reasonable to me as a as a site. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have any particular problems on okay. with it. Okay. So. Good. Are there any other uh, any other comments that people may need to make yet, Jamie? I mean, I do have several comments about the the draft uh, regulations. <coughs> There's some that seem a little confusing to me and would, that would need clarification if you want to have best drafted um, regs. You know, and I guess the first comment I had was on this third page. So that would be four subsection, number four subsection Roman numeral, small Roman numeral four. 
Which one? I'm sorry. That's no vendor shall it's vend anything. Street, yeah, no vendor shall vend anything. That is placed on the sidewalk or park path or on a blanket or board placed upon such surface or on the top of a trash receptacle or cardboard box. Right. So my, my first question, and I have this on another section too, is when it says no vendor shall vend anything, I'm assuming the intent probably is also for display because vending would mean that Maybe you're actually getting a sale versus just showing and, and hoping for a sale. I think mm -hmm. no vendor shall vend or display anything. It'd probably be a, mm -hmm. a more clear way to, to, to phrase it. Uh, and then the, the general question about that <coughs> subsection is, is the intent of that subsection four meant to prevent using blankets or cardboard for display? Or is it meant to keep vending off a sidewalk or a path. It, it was unclear to me what the overall intent of that subsection was. I could answer that. Go ahead, Mike. You know, as the staff that would be charged to interpret that, I would take it at its face value. No vendor shall vend or anything that is, or display, if you wish to add that, that is placed on a sidewalk or park path or on a blanket or board placed upon such surface or on the top of a trash receptacle or cardboard box. So this would prohibit displaying things uh, on a blanket or board on a sidewalk or a part of path or on top of a trash receptacle and if that did happen we would ask them to cease. So would that mean that you would be able to use a blanket or a board on the grass? I, I don't see a prohibition right. here of that. Uh, it's just yeah, as long as they don't the exceed path. the overall square footage. Because I think it's already covered by the earlier part of the reg saying that you're not allowed to put it on a path or a sidewalk. Yeah. So that would be a superfluous language. So it, it begs the question whether or not the intent was really to stop it from being on a blanket or a cardboard box. It's not what it says. I suppose I read that uh, to avoid any sort of cute argument that somebody says, well, my work of art is on a blanket. It's not placed on the sidewalk. And, and so I, I think it was sort of belt and suspenders approach. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really have a problem with the way the language is. I, I think display is inherently in, or implicitly included, though I don't have a problem adding that or displayed language either. Yeah. Um, just to erase any doubt. Sure. Uh, so if you made the, um, you made this, would display, would you modify your motion to include the word display? No. I'm you leave it the way it is? I, 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 my concern, if we do or display in part four, I mean, I just wonder if vend, every time we see the word vend, you have to add or display after it. And mm -hmm. so if we add or display in part, subpart four, mm -hmm. then we have you to go through, we, we might have to add it in several other places. So I, 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 I don't know leave what, I didn't hear what Kathy said, but I. She wasn't, she really didn't. I just sort of went, uh, cause I, I, I seconded <laughs> it. I mean, weren't you the one that, yeah, I don't think we need to add it. You don't right, think you need right. it? No. Okay. Uh, so if you think it's implied within the word vend is the display? I, I think so. Vending to me means not only the actual sale, but attempting to sell. Yeah. And I'm fine with okay. the way it's written. You are. <laughs> Instead of doing yeah. the uh, uh thing, yeah. Okay. So Jamie, is there anything else that, um, that you? Yeah, there's, and I'm okay <clears throat> with that, if the, if the will of counsel is to treat vend as displaying in the process yeah. of attempting to vend as well. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, subsection four, subsection six, just a couple below what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. There's no vendor shall use any amplification or verbally seek to attract customers. Yeah, I put a note in that unless a potential customer addresses them first, because you can certainly seek to verbally attract a customer after they address you, show some interest in your art. I'm gonna answer that. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the intent here is that we don't have loud talking but, you know, if, 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 if someone, you know, is in close proximity and, you know, a vendor says, hi, how are you? Uh, would you like to look at my stuff? That, that's, that's not the, I, I think people, it, it's affecting the character of the park if they start shouting at people and, you know, come over here. And that's what the intent of this, you know, we're, we're not going to, to normal discourse. You know, that's, we can't regulate normal discourse and, you know, would not seek to or try to. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that, okay. Jessica? Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly agree with Mike. I mean, my, when I 
read that, my impression would be that it would prevent something like somebody with an amplifier, hey, come over and look at my stuff, or somebody with a, a megaphone, or somebody that's, you know, calling out loud, loudly to the public that, in the, that you might see at a carnival or something like that. That just takes that, that element away and so that the, the, the uh, exchanges would be, you know, of a quiet nature and not hawking out to a crowd. I, yes, I mean, I, I interpret it the, the way that Jamie suggested we add to it, which is if, if a customer approaches the vendor and says, hey, what are you selling? Well, clearly, responding to that would not be implicated by this provision. I was at Art in the Park in South Portland and Mill Creek last weekend, and as I was walking by, a, a vendor came out and tried to get my wife and me to buy some of his photographs because he was doing a 10-minute sale. And, you know, I didn't, <laughs> it's like, you know, it, to me, that sort of wrecked the experience. You know, you just want to sort of look at art and see if you're interested and then approach the vendor. So um, I, I don't think we need to amend this. I, I, I think the town staff would be reasonable in how they in, in, enforce this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Jamie's right. If somebody approaches them, we're not, we're not going to disallow that by any stretch. I guess my concern would be more about some of the other vendors who are licensed in the park might think that someone is verbally interacting and might complain to the town. I would want to give the expressive artist enough leeway that you don't encourage complaints to the town by other vendors uh, that are licensed in the park. Briefly address that. Go ahead. Jamie, whenever you introduce anything into a park or something like that, and you introduce a profit motive, uh, we, it go, we, we have to deal with those issues all the time anyway. We, we, we deal with them now, and I expect we'll deal with them in the future. Mm -hmm. the, the vendors are, are very precise about what they want and rules and what they'd like us to try to do. And we have a good working relationship with all of them, but quite frankly, it, it's been a struggle at times over the last three years as we've, we've dealt with uh, a number of fairly issues of minutia. We have a good relationship with all the vendors now. It's working well. <clears throat> so, any further discussion? <laughs> I, I, I understand they'll be, they can have complaints no matter what. I just try to avoid potential litigation. Yeah. You know, based on complaints. And when people yeah. have language that's not as clear as it could be, yeah. you encourage more litigation. But the, the, the good thing about the, the park and, and all the different programs and activities we have there is that we, we always agree to, whenever we have new rules, we'll look at them a year from now. And for instance, the, the, there's a bus trolley issue. People are complaining about a, a van that is at the park constantly dropping off whole groups of folks. They're not charged on the bus system. So we've, one of the other people at buses is complaining about that. So we have agreed that the Portland Advisory Committee is part of this seasonal review of looking at all the rules. We'll consider whether or not they want to make a recommendation to council on that. And I consider this the same thing. If this is adopted, you know, we'll, we'll give it a try for uh, a year. And if need be, we'll go through the process of bringing back uh, any issues that need addressing. Good thoughts, though. I mean, you know, I mean, this kind of discussion is very good to have. I mean, I, and I appreciate, you know, you're looking at this and trying to sort of circumvent any possibilities down the road. But uh, um, I guess, uh, you know, it, like like everything, we're uh, if we do put this in place, we'll obviously have to notify staff and other people. But um, again, we do tend to look at these things annually and make sure that they're buttoned up and they're doing what it is that we originally intended. So any further discussion about this, Jamie or uh, David? Uh, not about the draft itself. So I don't just know if Jamie wanted to finish his comments on the draft first. I don't sure. know. He had just another more. point. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fine. Um, on, on five, on page three, number five, um, subsection one, it says, uh, no vendor shall vend anything using a display stand that provides less than six foot wide clear pedestrian path measured from the display at the opposite edge of any sidewalk or park path in front of such vendor. <coughs> so is, is the intent there, Mike, is, as you interpret it, would be that you have to be at least six feet back 
from the sidewalk? You do. And in, in, in this instance, with the site that the council has chosen, uh, I don't see this being a, a problem or an issue. Uh, you know, the, the, the issue when this was drafted was that they, they wanted to be sure that people on a sidewalk could still pass by, uh, you know, unimpeded. And since this is the site that's actually been apparently being chosen, is more of a, is more, you know, people go there specifically to, uh, you know, to buy and look at the different goods that are there or to hear the expressive speech. Uh, you know, this particular site, that shouldn't be an issue because there's not a sidewalk right there now. Right. And then right after that, it says, uh, occupies more than eight linear feet of public space parallel to any road, sidewalks, or park path. Yep. And I, I, the question I have is, why do we have the word parallel in there? Why, don't we just mean it should be more than eight feet long or three feet deep? Do, is, does it help us at all to say parallel to any road, sidewalk, or path, or is that just going to lead to confusion? My only response to that is, is a lawyer wrote it, and I'm not sure why you included that word. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it could lead to confusion. If we just yeah. change it to occupies more than eight linear feet uh, by three linear feet in depth, you know, yeah. an eight by three is what we're essentially looking yeah. for. It, that is what we're looking for. Uh, why the, the word parallel needed to be in there, I, I don't know. But the, the, the key is, is, is the overall dimensions. And, and, the, and the other key, you know, trying to keep it to a certain scope, a certain, a certain scale. So maybe we can modify that just to make it more clear to say eight feet by three feet. It's like a feng shui statement. I think what you're saying is no more than 24 square feet. No. So, so but, but David, you originally. No, you want no more than three feet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you. Eight by three. No more than eight by three. Okay. Well, but David. I, I guess now I understand the logic. Uh, because if you say, so does six by four not work? If, if we were to go with Jamie, in Jamie's direction, if you wanted to do a six by four foot area, that right. wouldn't work. No, it doesn't. Right, I think you don't, I think the intent is no deeper than three feet. They right. Something that. Now, I don't know how you're going to orient the eight artists, if they, if they ever ended up being eight artists, how you would orient them in there. Maybe the intent of the parallel is that the, that the table should be parallel to each other, so that you don't. Hodgepodge. Well, I think so one doesn't block another. Yeah. yeah, in general, given the space that we all seem to be thinking is the best space, this was, the concept behind this was this gives everybody a, a position that is optimally visible by lining them up in, a, in a parallel to, to the road such that no one is blocking anyone else. So you don't have people... Um, you know, uh, in the middle, that sort of thing. Is so. that feasible given the, the size of the space that you had? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Based on what we saw on the sidewalk, yes. Yes, and maybe right. uh, Mally could speak to that. Because it was 125 yeah. feet, if I remember correctly. 110. 110. So there was quite a bit of frontage. Yeah. And I think that Jessica's on to the parallel component, which is giving everybody visibility. Visibility to, to the public. And when we were out there, Bob I was showing us, you know, this is why they came up with this, because it, it, for those reasons. And I don't know if he wants to speak to that at all, but yeah. and Kathy might have a point. So is there something that, since David initiated this, um, is there something for David to modify in his, uh, I don't know. I, I, it doesn't sound that way. Well, Kathy had a point. Kathy, uh, sorry. You know, and I, I, I have to uh, concur with what Jessica said. Having visited the site, and once you see the site, you can see that it is parallel to roads. And if you had somebody, they might say, "Oh, well, I want to do it separate. I want to do it different. I'm going to do, I'm going to do sideways." And so, what does that do? Because we've had the eight, eight slots allowed, and you know they're three by eight. So, um, I am fine with the way it's written. Having seen the spot, um, you know, it might be different if you hadn't gone out there and seen it, but. Um, you know, I think it was really helpful to go there and, and you know, pace it out and, and listen to what, um, I don't know, whether it's 30 of us there looking at the different spots, so. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I, I'm just going to echo what Jim said a little bit earlier. I, you know, I, th I think these are good questions. Uh, I, th I also believe that after we have a year of this under our belt, I mean, it may be that there's only one set of artists. It may be that we get eight. But we might learn that, well, lo and behold, the better way to set up is three feet parallel or four. And then, so we could always mm. revisit that. I, I, I can't imagine uh, necessarily uh, the book being thrown at somebody if they went with four feet parallel and six feet depth. I mean, the spirit is really just that they shouldn't be taking up too much space. But I, my view is we could always revisit this. I, I, I wouldn't think this would lead to litigation. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else, Jamie? Yeah, I just want to just state in general that I, I, I want the Christiansons to know that you know I carefully reviewed the, the case law. I appreciate their their input on uh, the, the state of the law in this this area, and that I take the First Amendment rights very very seriously. Um, and I'm a big advocate of uh, a very broad view of First Amendment rights. Um, I, I do think that the way that it's been crafted that these are reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, and that I think the town council was wise to table it last time and to spend more time on the issue and review the case law. And I think the case law encourages us to do that, to be deliberative about uh, these types of regulations. But uh, I'm comfortable having reviewed the case law and looking at the regulations that that, that we've um, you know, that we're not. Uh, prejudicing any individual group from their their First Amendment rights, with the caveat that I, I do I think I've mentioned this to the council before that I think that it's worth considering whether or not we offer a general permit, a vendor's permit that's not limited to food vendors, so that if an artist was interested in paying a fee, they would have the equal, equal rights of uh, other vendors. In the Okay, um, any other conversation around this? Uh, Jessica, you raise your hand first. Well, I, what I was going to do is um, propose a motion to accept. The, uh, we have a motion on the table, yeah, we have one. I believe David and, and seconded yep. by Kathy. Okay. So we're ready to, okay. unless David has okay, a I guess point I he wants to make. Uh, just very briefly, um, you know, I, I want to thank the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. I don't know if we have a representative tonight for the work that they put into this. Uh, and now that I live closer to the fort, I walk it almost every day. And I walk that whole stretch through the dog path and then along the ocean side by the, by the lighthouse. And the fort is so beautiful, not only because of its location in the lighthouse, but also because of all the work that goes in by the volunteers to ensure that it remains that way. And when we were considering food vendors, there's a reason why they weren't placed where the Christiansons want to be placed. Uh, there was a, a decision made by the advisory commission that that would detract from the natural beauty of the park. So I, I, I like Jamie and like the other members of the council, I don't want to interfere with the Christiansons' <coughs> First Amendment rights. I don't want to interfere with their ability to sell their art. Uh, but I do think this is a reasonable uh, balance that has been struck by the council and uh, the, the overriding goal here is to preserve the aesthetics of the fort. So I will vote in favor of tonight's uh, motion. Well, thank you. I, I think that it's important to, to, to thank, obviously, the town manager as well as the Fort Williams Advisory Commission for the work that they did. And I believe we've been very deliberative about this whole thing, and I think that process is, is um, is important and and you know the, the more discussion we have around these types of things i think the better the decisions that we're making and i um you know i feel feel good about where we are today um and uh you know again uh, I, my hat's off to people like bob malley and others who have been you know marshalling this thing through and making sure that we're we're looking at it correctly and i'm i'm appreciative of that citizen input as well Yes, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to suggest a, a friendly second part of the motion. Uh, and that, it, you know, you're passing these this evening when you pass rules and regulations are effective immediately. And I want to make sure that all of our personnel have had a chance to read these or familiar with them. And what I'd like to do is have it effective a week from today uh, on the 19th. That way it'll give Bob and uh, Neil, uh, the, ch the chief of police, and Bob Malley time to make sure the rangers and uh, the other personnel that need to know 
uh, what the rules are. We'll have a chance to read them and be aware of them. David? That, that, I would certainly incorporate that into my motion, the okay, change great. suggested by the town manager. Great. And second it? It's fine. fine. Okay. Seeing no other discussion, all those in favor of the motion as amended? All those opposed? It passes 6-0. Thank you. Let's move on to item number 105. Chair will entertain a motion about building, building permit issuance notification procedures. Kathy, she's having trouble with her computer just like I was. Building permit issuance notification. Yeah. All right. So this is from the planning board? Uh, where uh, the recommendation is to set a public hearing. Okay, so I move that we set a public hearing for, uh, somebody have the date? Monday, September the 9th at Pardon? 7 p.m. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll second that motion. Any discussion about the, this public hearing? Again, this whole, uh, this, this issue as you folks uh, realized came as a result of um, some permits that were issued and some notifications that uh, expired before folks knew they were in existence and uh, I think that um, Ben and uh, has spent quite a bit of time trying to make sure that this is right and uh, I think the public hearing is, uh, is in order and um, I look forward to getting additional citizen input before we go forward. Any other discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? 6-0. Moving on to 106, it's a request to permit 100 seats in the restaurant in a BA zone. Chair will entertain a motion. Jessica? Uh, <clears throat> I move that we approve item number 106, request to permit 100 seats in restaurants in the BA zone. Um, be referred to, the to be board. referred to the planning board. I'm sorry, yes. This is to refer this to the planning board. I knew that. <laughs> okay. Do we have a second to this? Frank, thank you. Any discussion? Could we get just a little bit of background on this? Sure, that'd be great. Um, thank you. Ben, uh, Michael, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I, know, I have the background from Ben, but <laughs> yeah. let Michael give it to you. Uh, currently in a BA zone, uh, there's a limitation of uh, restaurants to have no more than 80 seats. Uh, we received a letter from Lisa and Tony Costopoulos, uh, the owners of The Good Table, uh, asking for the ability to have 100 seats uh, in the restaurant. And, uh, you know, it, it basically goes into, you know, how much business they can potentially do. Uh, you know, if, the, if this was eventually approved, uh, you know, it would still need to go before the planning board uh, to get permission to put uh, the extra seats in to make sure the parking's sufficient, the septic system is sufficient and all those other issues. And, and I would like to mention, I, 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 when Tony brought this in, Costopoulos, about two weeks ago, I didn't specifically tell him until today that I, it was, in fact, on the agenda today. When I called him today, and he was unable to make it. So it, his absence is not because of any, uh, you know, desire not to see this move forward. It was simply we, we, we confirmed late that it was, in fact, on the agenda, and he had made other plans for this evening. Just asking, um, how, how does that affect the parking? Is there a correlation there? Or? How does it affect what? Parking? parking? You know, it, it, it's something that, you know, if you added additional seating, I'm sure the planning board, you know, would want to look at it. It's one, another reason why you refer this to the planning board is, you know, the, the big issues with any of these things is, is septic capacity and, and parking. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the, there, are, there are a number of restaurants in town already that have parking challenges. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? David? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the planning board, when they investigate whether to recommend such an ordinance change, would also take a look at other properties in the BA zones to see uh, what impact that would have overall with the, all the properties within those zones. So uh, I, I, by referring it to the planning board, I think it's a good idea to do that. This is obviously a viable, successful business. We want to be supportive. but. I'm sure the planning board will do its work and its research to decide whether or not to actually rec recommend that change back to us. Great. Frank? Uh, two questions. One, do you know if this includes seating on the porch or is it just interior space? All of the seating. Yeah. Okay. And two, um, in any other zones in town, 
is there permitted 100 seating in restaurants? I guess it would just be the commercial zone. Uh, you know, this it's only excessive 80, I guess. I, I I don't deal with this from day to day, so I'm I'm just not too sure yeah. what the seating. You know, we the only other place where restaurants might be would be in the town center zone, and I'm not sure if there's a. Yeah. Uh, I'm licensed for 60 seats, yeah. but uh, it's only because that's really parking. as much as I could fit in. Yeah. And I mean, they're gonna they'll have a challenge parking wise clearly because but that'll mm -hmm. be for the planning board to, to consider. Yeah. Because they already have a parking park, they already park on the street. Yeah. Yes. So. yes, Jessica. Well, I was just gonna say that I mean, in the letter that they had submitted to the town manager, they felt that they would their request would be supported by additional or ad additional adequate parking and I'm sure that the planning board would likely be um, reviewing such things with the police chief and the fire chief as well so any other questions yes Jamie so is the process that would go to the planning board they'd send it back to us to send the ordinance committee and no. then would there be yes. a public hearing on a yeah. proposed change yes yeah. that would be the process any other seeing no other conversation all those in favor all those opposed six zero item 107 the pavement management study report michael uh yes i note the presence of mr malley here and tom gorrell uh bob and i uh felt that with the investment we make in roads and looking at particularly some of our tira roads and uh, needing a little attention and uh, looking at uh, the need to get good data to be as part of our capital improvement plan, that we ought to get someone who really understands pavement uh, to look at it for us. And uh, Tom Gorrell uh, is here. He, he's, he's the engineer expert. He's uh, with Gorrell Palmer Consulting Engineers. And you know, this is important. I think it's, I think it's important to spend a little bit of time on it because the investment that we would be making, you know, is over $7 million over the course of you know, the, the, the next 10 years or so. So I really appreciate that Tom has prepared a presentation for you and uh, happy to introduce Tom to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, I would like to spend um, maybe 15 minutes or so tonight, if that's about the right time frame, to just sort of hit the highlights of the report. Um, we, uh, just a little bit about us, we're located up in Gray and we do a lot of transportation uh, projects and as far as pavement management studies, there's a lot more interest in those today for a variety of reasons which I think will become evident as we go through this uh, presentation. Uh, some of the, we've done many, but some of the ones we've done more recently would include Gray and Wyndham. Wyndham will be doing a, well, both Gray and Wyndham will be doing again um, this fall. We've done Auburn, I think, three times. Portland will be doing again this fall. Uh, PAX Collector Roads, um, we've done twice and we'll be doing those again. Um, there's a couple hundred miles of, of the collector roads in the PAX region. And then also, uh, the city of Westbrook. So what are we doing? Why do this? Um, and it's really to inventory um, your pavement, which is really an asset, your roadways are an asset, um, and determine what their condition is in kind of an analytical and comprehensive way as much as we can. Um, and to give a benchmark, if you will, to evaluate the roads uh, against one another. So it, it gives a bit more of a science uh, behind deciding um, what the maintenance strategy is for their conditions. Um, it's also the result really is to uh, allocate the resources that you put in, uh, which are obviously scarcer and scarcer these days, uh, to your roadway system as efficiently as possible. You want to spend the dollar just as the best way you can. Um, this chart is kind of illustrates um, how pavement deteriorates over time. Um, as, as we start up here, and we'll call this a, a, a pavement rating of five, and we'll get into that in a little bit, um, but all pavement begins to decline. And at some point, you'll see this chart's fairly illustrative of that. It begins to tail off very quickly. 
What you want to be doing is to try to overlay that roadway at the right time. If you don't overlay it at the right time, but wait till you're maybe down in here, it's not going to be nearly as effective. And I think we've all seen roadways get overlaid that um, we know the cracks are just going to come right back up through. Um, and it's not a great use of the dollar. It looks good for a while, it looks great for a while, for maybe three, four years. But it doesn't look good for any longer than that. And clearly, once it gets down to this point, that's really when you need to, uh, what we say there is rehabilitation or actually reconstruction. The inventory we use is, a, is an inventory or a system, I should say, that's developed by the Department of Transportation years ago. It's a visual methodology, so we go out and we look at that. We're not taking pavement samples. That would be a lot more. Uh, expensive in depth, require a lot more resources. We're not doing any um, subsurface exploration as well, such as borings or that sort of thing to tell what's underneath it. Just a note on that, one of the things that um, we will go back to some communities and do them again, once you have a couple of data points, you can take a roadway that if, if you took a roadway that had a, just an overlay on it and maybe shouldn't have had one, versus one that was reconstructed, they're both going to look the same when we look at them. But if you look at them again in two years and do this methodology, one is going to deteriorate much more quickly than the other one. And that's why getting more than one data point is kind of important. And you've done this before. You haven't done it in a while, but you've done it before. Um, so the inventory looks at cracks. There's a lot of different sorts of cracks that are looked at. There's transverse cracks. Um, those are cracks that go across the roadway. There's longitudinal cracks. You're familiar with those that sometimes go right down along the center line where they put down the two, uh, you know, laid the pavement down. Um, there's edge cracking. There's load, which is really caused by, by a load. You know, we all see the uh, roadways that have little dished out areas where the tires go and those can be you know lead to hydroplaning that sort of thing uh, there's distortion and, and then patching um, there's and there can be a combination of those as well obviously the survey looks at streets uh, that are less than a mile long what we do for those is every quarter mile we'll inventory them and streets that are uh, over a mile we do every half mile so obviously this is um, kind of a, it's an overview, it's not real detailed, and it does require once we get the roadways filtered so that the ones in the most need sort of rise to the top, it requires the town to sort of follow up and, and uh, there's no resource uh, quite like Bob certainly to be able to go out and see and take that information and refine it a little bit further. This is intended to be the first cut. Um, and survey sections, when we do them, they're 100 feet in length. So we'll inventory the type of cracking in that 100 feet. Um, some of the other things we do, we just started doing this actually, was to, you know, you want, as you go back in two, three, four years, you want to hopefully take the uh, inventory maybe at the same point again, because you want to kind of compare this, the same location if you can. And you can do that, obviously, by um, the distance you are from certain things. But we've also done it with GPS to make it a little bit easier. In our uh, inventory, there were 434 uh, sections that were surveyed. Um, came out to a total of 61.85 miles long. And uh, again, pavement condition only. And what we come up with is we put that information into a program and we come out with what's called a pavement condition rating, which ranks pavement from zero to five, with five being brand new pavement. Then what we look at is various treatment alternatives. Um, a lot of things that you can do, obviously you can reconstruct a roadway completely, which we all know and we can overlay a roadway, but there's a range of things that you can do in between. And uh, we have identified, uh, and, and I should say once we've come up with some of these treatments, this first cut at this point, some of these have been uh, refined a bit 
uh, by Bob, and they'll continue to do so as, as time moves on. There's a lot of reasons you might not want to do some roadways that are in the kind of the high uh, area of need. For instance, you might have some utility projects coming up. Uh, Bob might know of some water or sewer uh, things that need to be done, so you wouldn't want to overlay that and then dig it up again in the future. Uh, there might be uh, situations where you're doing a couple of roads in the neighborhood and you might as well hit the third and fourth while you're there so you're not coming back in and driving over those roads again in just a few years' time. Um, but some of the treatments are uh, an overlay, what, what we call a future overlay. That's three-quarters of an inch of shim. And what a shim does is just uh, a roadway wants to have a fairly uniform cross slope of about a quarter of an inch per foot so that drainage will go from the center line off the road. Um, and sometimes you get deformity in that cross section, so the contractor tries to shim that out to get a uniform um, cross slope. So in some areas you'll have a little more than three quarters, other areas you'll have very little as he tries to even that out. And once you've done the shim, then you overlay an inch. When we say future overlay, that's usually something that needs to be done in five years' time. Then there's a light overlay in shim. That's the same, but it's something that's more immediately needed in the next year or two. Yes, sir. I understand the first thing. The inch is put on in five years, or the road repaired like this will last five years? The top one would be, it would be needed to put on in five years. The second one would need to be put on now. Um, and then there's a heavy, the, the remainder of these would need to be done now. The heavy overlay is uh, a three-quarter inch shim and an inch and a half. We've increased it by a half an inch of paving. And then there's something called reclaim or reclamation. And with that, what you do is you grind up the pavement and you mix it with some of the base material that's there. And you compact that and then you uh, overlay. Essentially, you put six inches of pavement on top of that. So you're sort of putting all new pavement on but you're using the pavement that's there to enhance the base material that's there, essentially. You can't do that all the time because you are, um, you, you take some of the uh, material away when you do it, but nonetheless, the tendency is to raise the road a little bit by a few inches, and that can be problematic, certainly, if you're in a residential area with adjacent driveways because you're gonna increase the grade, potentially, uh, associated with the driveway unless it's steep going up, in which case you're, you're going to help it out. Um, and also if you're in an area where you have curbed, we can't really add uh, much in the way of elevation to it because you'd lose your curb. So reclaim can be used in some areas, but we need to be careful where we use it. And then uh, when we really are, um, the pavement is in very poor shape, obviously at that point we're, we are looking at just reconstruction. Yes, sir. So uh, presumably the uh, from top to bottom the road's in decent shape, it's a terrible shape. Exactly. And so uh, each one of those treatments, does it give the road ultimately the same life? In other words, reconstruction is done in 20 years. By doing the future overlay, does that give you 20 years? No. Okay. It does not. That's a good question. You're obviously going to, you are going to need to come back and hit that roadway again. Um, you know, it, it probably in, um, you know, uh, maybe six, seven year cycle sort of thing is when you're going to hit it again. Did the first one every six or seven years? Did you road last forever? What happened? If, I'm sorry? Did the first one every six or seven years and prevented it from getting any worse? Oh, okay. Did the road last permanently? It'll last a long time. Yes, it will. If it's probably, properly based, heat, um, you really shouldn't, um, again, that's assuming a lot of things like drainage and that sort of thing, but you're looking at 25, 30 years at least for a roadway that's properly based and you're just doing, needing to do pavement, if you're really good about doing that. So a reconstructed road, when does that need to be hit with the future roadway? That's going to need to be hit probably in, um, it can depend, but I would say in about seven years you'd need to hit with an overlay. So basically the, the uh, duration of a road is 25 years if you maintain it perfectly. Yes, or, or potentially more, yeah. Yep. Um, now again, that all depends. There are huge variables here because um, there's loading on the roadway, 
because a roadway can deteriorate. That's why it's hard to generally answer. It depends on the amount of traffic that's on a roadway. Uh, obviously, a roadway that sees a lot of truck traffic is going to last a lot, uh, lot less, need a lot more maintenance, if you will, than a roadway that has three houses on it if it was built to the same standard. Do you build them to the same standards? You generally don't. You generally have more pavement and more um, you know, gravel, if you will, in a roadway with less traffic on it. That's what you try to do. And your town standards are typically more or less set up that way. So a road with three homes on it, you build it to a standard that would get, still give you 25 years, roughly? You'd, you would build it to a standard. You'd have less material in it, like I said, but you do also have to consider a minimum amount because in the spring what happens, um, it's, it needs to be well drained, but you do have the frost action, and that can, can also influence that. So there's just a lot of variables. But that's one of the things that uh, once you come up with um, essentially your program of what you want to do with this initial cut, that's why it's so important that each roadway that's in that cut be looked at again and, and reprioritized. Thank you. And again, I can't say enough about drainage because that's what destroys a road is really the drainage, the drainage and the loading. Um, that may not be really well in focus, but essentially it's a bar graph of where your town stands um, with the mileage that's in each category. And the, um, the 2013 mileage is in, I'll call it, I guess, the tan color. Um, it looks better on my screen. It's actually yellow and blue, but... Um, so you can see that right now you guys have really been doing a terrific job because you have a lot of uh, mileage in the very good category, um, quite a lot in good, fair, and, and well, fair to good and fair. You'll see you have very little uh, in the lower three categories, almost none. So that's great. It's a good starting point. If you did nothing today for the next three years, um, our projection is that you'd end up where we've shown the 2016, so everything begins to slide. You would, in all likelihood, go out of uh, the mileage that's currently in the very good. So that's an indication of why it's a good idea to kind of keep poking at it. Um, I know the strategy some communities have is to try to be very consistent so that they don't get, delay some of it and have to spend a lot all at once. It's kind of better to spend it consistently over time is the, is the idea. What are the numbers on the murder block taxes represent? Those are actually just the percentages. percentages. Of the 61 miles? Correct. Okay. And what is 2013 miles versus 2016? Actually, I think, uh, I'm, I'm actually wrong. I think that's mileage that we had up there. We've done it both ways, but I think on that one it's mileage if I remember. I think that probably adds up. So, so half of the 61 is in good condition. Correct. Okay. Yep. And what is the uh, 13, 2013 mileage versus 2016 mileage? What does that mean? The uh, amount of mileage that's in each category. It's the deterioration over time. Correct. So that you don't have any mileage in that very good anymore. And that's assuming we do nothing. That's assuming not, no money is spent. Nothing, nothing is spent. The next three. Correct. Right. So you save a lot of money. Yeah. But it's just, it does show that it kind of has an effect. So if we do the minimum, which is what we've been doing, <laughs> would that graph look very different? <laughs> so these um, kind of summarizes the treatment alternatives and, and um, kind of goes over again what you do, what we recommend for each PCR range. One thing I would like to point out, what you mentioned earlier about these were generally in an order, that's true except for this mill and fill category. That is quite a PCR range. And the reason for that is, again, there may be situations where an overlay would work just fine, typically. But it's in a curb section, and so you really can't, you have to mill it because you, you can't add to the elevation with another overlay. Curbing, when you have curbing in, it typically has a, uh, a re, what we call a, a reveal, a distance between the pavement and the top of the curb is somewhere between six or seven inches. So if you did have an inch and a half uh, overlay and you had a seven inch curb, you're, you're back to five and a half. You do that a couple of times and you begin at that point to, lead, to 
get to the limit of where uh, you would begin to lose the integrity of the curb. So at that point, you'd want to start grinding. But other than that, they're generally in the order you were, were speaking of. Now, the, for me, the interesting element of this uh, presentation is that it seems that the, there's about 2.2 million of work that really should get done right away, next two years. And then the remainder, we have some flexibility. So if we are in a situation where funding is not available or we want to you know, move things around, we have that flexibility to do it. That's the, that's the beauty of this tool. It's not exact. Again, there's no substitute for Bob going out and kind of refining that a little bit more. But in general, absolutely, that's, that's the beauty. understanding the, the total realm of good maintenance and sewage and other roads. Correct. The other thing it tells you is sort of overall, this is a, uh, something that you look at over about a 10 year, uh, as you can see, eight to, eight to 10 years is the farthest out. It's a good thing to try to go through the cycle every 10 years if you can. And so that's you know, a little less than a uh, million dollars a year, certainly. That's exactly what we should do, about a million a year for our roads in order to maintain them at a level that they are today. I would say so, yes. It's pretty cool. So you never finish doing this, you've always done it. Right, I, right. There's obviously construction inflation, and, and I should hasten to also... That's what I want to know about construction inflation. There is. Um, construction inflation has been sort of non-existent, um, except in materials, certainly during the recession. But it's going to go off, take off again, um, and it's just pretty much like most inflation. I mean, the average consumer inflation has reflected a lot in it. Again... It's also very related to the price of oil. It can be absolutely related to the price of oil, but you know, there's, there's no doubt about that. Although it's not directly tied, it's, it can be um, similar. Yep. So um, I think it seems like I was going to say one other thing, but it's flew out of my mind. So um, with that, I guess I would just take questions if you have any. FYI, what follows is the next item with, with Tom laying the groundwork. The next item is Bob is going to be explaining what we actually hope to do over the next five years based on the knowledge we now have. I know it was the other thing I was going to say. I think I've said it before, but I want to uh, emphasize it again, is that this is it's a visual uh, tool, and it's looking at your pavement and your pavement structure. So it's looking at the pavement, it's looking at the, the gravel or the base underneath the pavement. It's not looking at drainage. So if you have drainage issues where you need to replace culverts, where you have uh, utility issues where those need to be squared away, this doesn't have anything to do with that. It doesn't include things like if you had guardrail that needed to be put in or, or those sorts of things or curbing or whatever. It doesn't address that. This is addressing your pavement structure, which is made up of the, of the bituminous and also the gravel. Um, yeah. Just, just prior, prior to maybe when Bob comes up, but as, as you laid this out and the way we've been approaching this, were there any particular um, you know, highlights or outliers that, that turned up in the process that we were not factoring into the way we go about deciding what we were doing over the last several years? Actually, I don't think so. You came out pretty well. It looked to me like you, I mean, it's great not to have, um, it's particularly in this climate that we've had, roadways that are in the poor and very poor because you're not going to be having to spend a lot of money on reconstruction roads. And that's where, really where it costs a lot of money uh, to go in and reconstruct the roadways. Um, so no, I think um, it, been doing a pretty good job is, is the way I see it. Thank you. The, the other factor that's affected is the sewer projects. And back in the, the 1986, 87, 88 period, we had a lot of sewer projects that got a lot done. Those roads, we've been getting at a lot of particularly residential roads lately. And you know, what, if you look at overall the roads, what Bob's going to be looking at is that most of our residential roads are in pretty good shape, the, the residential streets. Well, we're having more difficult times, or what we would call the collectors and feeders, the, the Fowler's Old Ocean Houses and uh, Charles Road and some of those. Thank you. Which you'd, I mean, they do have the heavier loads, the, the tougher. Yeah. 
as it's most communities are that way. Great. Any questions for Jessica? Question? No, I just wanted to thank you for uh, certainly for not being a civil engineer. <laughs> I found this. <laughs> I, I liked the report. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought it was just well organized and it gave us important information and, and uh, I just thought you did a very nice job. Well, and that's in part too because of, of Bob's guidance because, you know, he has a red pen which he was used freely and that's great. That's what we want. That's why we send him a draft. So it was kind of a team effort on that, but I'm, I'm glad, it, uh, glad it read well. I mean, it was, it was user-friendly reading even though... <laughs> Excellent. You know, it's, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? I guess the next item is yours. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. You're done with it? You got it. Okay. Michael, any action required from us to accept the acknowledge receipt of the report? Could I get a motion to uh, acknowledge the receipt of the report? So moved. So moved. Anybody second? I'll yes. second. Any discussion about receiving the report? All those in favor? Thank you. Appreciate that. So as, as Mike said, uh, the next item is to propose to you a plan moving forward uh, for the next five years, which uh, we're going to key up on the screen here. And uh, uh, it's, you know, in conjunction with the capital stewardship plan, which you're going to be receiving in your next item, um, I think it really, you know, provides a good working document. Uh, we haven't put one of these together in a long, long time. Uh, some of it, it's, you know, funding challenges over the years. but. I think what it provides us is, you know, some detail and some proposals to you so we all are on the same page moving forward. Um, in the past, at capital improvement plans, we've listed projected expenditures in our roadway and drainage account, but we really haven't provided any detail to accompany those. You know, you've seen the 300000 and hasn't really been programmed uh, for a particular project. Um, and it's also helpful for us internally uh, just to sort of manage our work, uh, to work with the utility companies like the gas company and Portland Water District. Uh, they, uh, we continually are in contact with them about uh, roads that we're, we'd like to do, future roads, because they, they, they're actually doing the same thing with their capital improvement planning. They're looking at water main upgrades. They're looking at gas extensions. So they really want to know what we have in mind for projects. Uh, so it's important that we communicate uh, with those folks on a regular basis. Um, you know, as Mike said, it's an, it's an ambitious plan, um, and it does focus on our collector and our feeder streets. If you look at these, you see Sawyer, you see Spurwink, you see Fowler, Old Ocean House Road, uh, segments of 77. And those are the roads that most people travel on. Uh, the good thing is, uh, you know, again, as, we sh uh, as was discussed earlier, uh, we did uh, a lot of work in 2006 as part of the Southern Cape uh, Rehabilitation, or the Sewer Rehabilitation Plan. Uh, did a lot of work in Elizabeth Park, uh, in Mountain View Park, and in Broad Cove. So as part of replacing the sewers, we also reconstructed the roads and did drainage work with them. So those roads are, are high or in, still in very, very good condition. And uh, we've also done some work. We did um, a lot of paving in Shore Acres this past June. We just completed the Charles Road project. Last year we did the Starboard Drive project. All those helped our sort of local road mileage become in, in very good condition. Uh, as Tom said, you know, it's sort of reserved the right to alter the treatments or vary the treatments or even alter the batting order, you might say, if, if there are utility conflicts or uh, mobilization issues. We, again, we try to group roads together, so that's why you see in, in this uh, fiscal year we've, we're trying to do Sawyer or proposing to do Sawyer and Spurlink together. They're close by each other. Anytime we have to remobilize or sort of pick up our paving equipment and move it to a different location, that costs us extra money. So um, we also look at, you know, if there's unforeseen drainage problems that pop up. Um, that could alter the mix here. But the real big issue here is, is funding. And what we're proposing um, is obviously considerably more than what we've done in the past. 
but as Tom said, you know, we have to look at that aging factor uh, of the pavement. And, you know, when you look at this list right now, I look at it, and I've got a little bit of a bias, but a lot of these could all be done today <laughs> other than Two Lights Road and maybe a couple of others. There's needs on Scott Dyer, there's needs on Old Ocean House, but we tried to prioritize them uh, to, uh, again, try to hit that <coughs> curve before they need reconstruction and to tackle some of the roads that, uh, you know, we're spending more time on in the spring and in this wintertime patching them, replowing them, resalting them. So there's actually a benefit to some of this in the wintertime where we use less salt on the roads because there's more uniform surface and we don't have to plow them as often or we don't have to put as many abrasive salt and sand on because they're crowned and they're shaped better. So, uh, so there are sort of year-round advantages. Uh, we've also modified uh, some of the treatments a little bit in Tom's report. For example, on uh, Charles E. Jordan Road, we're adding, we've added sort of a, a reclaim component to it. There's some areas there where uh, the, the crown of the road isn't quite as uniform or defined. So we're looking at areas that it might be beneficial to go in and reclaim a portion of those. Scott Dyer Road, Mike and I have discussed. Uh, doing something with the sidewalks down there. So this isn't simply a, a paving program. We're at the same time we look at drainage, but we also look at sidewalks. Uh, Hillway, for example, if you've come up Hillway here in the town center, really isn't a definition between the edge of the road and the sidewalk. And so it, when we do those roads, we'd really like to address some pedestrian improvements at the same time, especially on Scott Dyer. Um, I won't go down line by line on all of these, you know, through the years, but I, I guess I would like to highlight what we're doing in this fiscal year. Um, and uh, some of the projects uh, is un are underway. Uh, we're looking at Sawyer and Spro Inc. Uh, Sawyer would be the section between Eastman and Thicket. And the reason why some of these we're doing segments is they were actually treated or paved in different years. So uh, you'll see, you know, rather than doing the whole road, there's only a certain segment that needs to be done because that's probably the oldest section that was paved. So um, they're, not, they're not broken up just to limit the space, it's because the treatment was done at a certain time frame. Um, there's some, uh, that road was actually reconstructed uh, back in ar around 1992, or actually, actually a little bit later than that. But there's, we've seen some pa pavement failure on it. So that's a road that we can do a heavy overlay on, uh, do a shim and, and do an inch and a quarter, inch and a half on top of that and uh, still uh, provide some structural integrity to the road. Spro Inc., you've probably all traveled between uh, the Perputic Club and the medical building. There's some pavement rutting in that area, doesn't scrape well, uh, so we're proposing to go in and do uh, a heavy overlay on that section. The Shore Road Path Connector uh, is underway as we speak. Uh, things are going well with that. We actually, as Mike said, did some paving today down between Surf Road and Cottage Lane. Uh, that project should be wrapped up by the second uh, or third week in September at the latest, assuming everything goes well. Um, there's a small section of Shore Road out here adjacent to Key Bank that was uh, rated actually one of the lowest uh, PCRs. Uh, that wasn't paved because we were holding off and we did the town center intersection project, uh, which as you know uh, was tabled. So there's a short section there that needs to be paved. Um, as far as local roads, again, a little bit lesser emphasis on those, but uh, some of the roads, uh, one of the roads actually that was rated the worst, I think it was to 1.8, was Balsam Road. And uh, Mike and I took a look at it and it's, you know, there's actually grass growing up to the, to the end of the road. It's in very, very poor condition. So we'd like to get in and pay what, what we call a Two Lights Terrace neighborhood. And again, uh, to save on mobilization, you know, Two Lights Terrace is probably the better of the three between Balsam and Lighthouse Point Road, but it just makes sense to go in there and, and, and pave the neighborhood. And finally, we're proposing to correct a drainage problem that we have on Shore Road uh, in the area of Chimney Rock Road. We've actually got water that ponds on the westerly or the, or the land side of Shore Road, historically ponded there. Uh, it posed a challenge for us when we did the Shore Road path. Uh, we ended up being able to drain uh, the water off, but it flows under a culvert that has failed under Shore Road and then down onto private properties without any known easements to the town. So we're proposing in the spring to install a small drainage system there and connect it to an existing one to alleviate that problem. So uh, we've got, you know, a busy year uh, 
planned in spring. And uh, with this, if you look at the chart there, there's, there's a lot of needs up there. Again, Fowler, Old Ocean House, Charles E. Jordan Road. Uh, you know, you think Charles E. Jordan Road, geez, it's a dead end road, it doesn't get a lot of traffic. It actually does. Uh, I walked down there a fair amount myself, and um, it's, it's a very, uh, it's used a lot by pedestrians, but there's a fair amount of traffic on it. So I think, you know, I think this gives us a good plan to move forward. Again, it's detailed. Um, it, it'll help both myself, utility companies, the council, so you know what we're programming for in the, in the next five year cycle. I really want to thank both Tom and Bob. I think what's really important, what you see here, is for the next five years we really have a plan. Mm -hmm. And when, when folks ask, when is this road going to be done, that, when is that road going to be done, we believe that we can give them reasonable assurances provided that we, we, we look at the, the, the bigger picture of capital stewardship needs in, in the community, and that's something I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes. But, uh, you know, we believe this is doable, and our strong sense is that people want these, these collector roads, these feeder roads, to be in good, passable, and safe condition. And some of them uh, are deteriorating pretty rapidly at this point. Any questions for Bob? Yes, Frank. Bob, how is your plan adjusted by what the consultant study told you? Um, I think it falls pretty much in line. Um, again, looking at mobilizations, uh, we moved up. We actually took Spurlink and broke it in two segments. It was originally done as one, again, to sort of save on those mobilization costs. Um, we look at the utility upgrades, look at any impact. You know, if there's any possible or potential for a, a small sewer extension on Old Ocean House Road, which has been discussed, you know, at the staff level, we might want to hold off on that to make sure that that gets done. Um, but no, I think it, you know, it, 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 it coincides or it mirrors Tom's plan pretty well, I think. Um, and again, looking at, you know, where are, where's, where do we want to focus our efforts on? Where are people traveling the most? Um, and we sort of based it on that. But I, I, think it, I think it works with this plan quite well. And did you use the same estimates of costs that he used? Those are Tom's estimates. No, the estimates are you're right. That's correct. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, so Tom's estimate or, or assessment was that for 2013-15, we should spend about 2.2 million, and this plan calls for about 925,000. Where's the difference? Um, I might defer to Mike on that. I yeah. think we're just spreading it out over a couple more years, recognizing all the other needs, and and you know, we, we feel that by Knowing when we're going to do things, it'll create, and, and seeing, as you said, it, we should be spending a lot more. We're hoping it will create the discipline to do the items on this project. And, and you, know, when, you know, when we look fiscally ahead, you know, we're, we're coming out of the economy a little bit, and I, I think the, the capital stewardship plan will show that, that these, it is affordable to be doing more. But, but, you know, I, but to suddenly you know, spend an extra million dollars, uh, you know, I, I think as long as we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and we can, uh, we, we don't need to spend that immediately. Now, the, the other big difference is, is that, that I don't think Tom's thing totally captures is that most of our roads, you know, we, there, there are good points and bad points to being a cape. And one of the good points is, is the truck traffic we have is only truck traffic serving Cape Elizabeth. <coughs> We're not getting through truck traffic. So as a result, we're not, and, and you know, building three new homes last year too, you know, we're not getting the heavy truck traffic and some of the things that are tearing our roads apart like you would get in other places where they do have a, you know, a lot of uh, through traffic. We, you know, we, we're dealing with, you know, vans and, and SUVs and some trucks, but nowhere near the extent that some other communities have. And I want to emphasize what, you know, Tom mentioned about drainage, is that drainage is critical. You, know, you talk about paving a road, shimming, and put an inch on, and what, what's the longevity of that? It's really a factor of the sub-base material, the base gravel. You can pave a road tomorrow, and in three years you'll see that failure because the subsurface, the drainage, is not what it is on some of our newer built roads like Cross Hill and the starboard drives and those. So they're going to fail at a faster rate. Thank you, Bob, as usual. All right, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate the effort. Yep. Thank you very much both of you for your coordination of your time and balance to get us this report and we need to take uh
a motion to accept Bob's uh, presentation as well. I mean, I so move. Seconded. Second. Second. All those in favor? Yeah, thank you. That's right. good. Thank you. I just want to be clear. Bob presented you the 2014 list. Right. That was not exactly what was in your budget document. You know, the, the monies are out there. We're not asking for any additional appropriated monies. But we just want to be clear to you, those are the priorities that we're going to do in 2014. Yep. The, the rest of the future years are subject to appropriations, whatever. Yep. But I wanted to make clear that, that these projects will be done in 2014. Yep. And that's, that, that isn't, a, it isn't just accepting. That is, even though you sort of defer to Bob, I just want to make clear we're taking that as an endorsement to do those 2014 projects. Does anybody have a redirect on that? I, I'm fine with that. I understood the 14 plan based on what he presented today. So, okay. Thank you. Moving on to items 109, the capital stewardship plan. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I have a brief presentation on this one. It's, you know, it's, I think everyone's aware the council has a goal this year of looking at our capital needs and eventually uh, to have the finance chairs uh, meet together and to look at the school needs, look at the municipal needs to make sure that everything is concerted, working together in one big happy family. Uh, we're, we're working toward that, and I think this capital stewardship plan is, is in keeping uh, with, with both the goal of uh, looking at long-term planning for the entire community, but it's also looking specifically at the importance of stewardship and the importance of maintaining our assets uh, that we have currently and also in the future. And this PowerPoint is with the, the council packet section of the website, and we also, there's copies of the full capital plan there. I do want to emphasize that we're all getting older. Uh, you, we may not need to be reminded of that, but you know, was, just was that, as, was that part of the capital? It's plan? part of the, it's, yeah, it's part of my presentation. Uh, and you know, just as we're getting older, our buildings are getting older, the equipment's aging, uh, our roads age, as, as you just heard from Tom, and some of the technology we have, you know, becomes a little more obsolescence over time. And you know, it, and it seemingly we have a lot of we have a lot of new buildings, and you know we do. But a lot of those new buildings are now 15 years old, and in the next 10-year planning period, they're 25 years old. So it's uh, you know I think it's important to remember that is that is that we're all everything's getting older, and you know particularly uh, you know as we look at uh, you know having been respons been responsible as counselors and others for some of these things, it, we can quickly say, oh, that was just done, and then we look at the calendar and we find out, no, it was a, it was a, it was a few years before we thought it was. Uh, so, you know, we're we looking at this in, context of, in the context of where we stand fiscally. Uh, you know, how, how are we doing financially? How are we going to pay for, for what needs to be done? So it, what we, we did is we, we looked at the plans that came from the roadway drainage, we looked at uh, Greg Miles did work looking at the Harriman study, looking at all the different buildings. We looked at technology. We looked at all of our equipment needs from the various departments, and we also looked at you know where do we stand with the retirement of debt and how does this all mix in with that. And what we identified over the next ten years was about twenty one million dollars of, of capital needs. Uh, and you know that sounds like an awful lot of money, and it is. It's an average of two point one million a year over the 10 years. So, you know, how would we pay for this? It would seem looking that we could do it by funding eight million towards new bonds. And, you know, if you look at the slide up above, we're retiring a little under seven million in, in municipal bonds. So we're sort of during the period replacing bonds with bonds, not, in, you know, ignoring the fact we've already reduced in the last five years, you know, by about another seven million without, without incurring, you know, the, the general trend is down. We're also looking at 12.5 million from annual budget appropriations. Right now, we've been going through this, trying to add 100,000 each year to the CIP line in the budget. This proposes to continue to do this. And then the, the final piece is sometimes when we have, you know, I announced earlier tonight we had 200,000 more. You know, we, we try to reserve some of those funds when we weren't quite expecting them to carry out, and I'm projecting we'll do at least 700,000 of that over the next 10 years, and particularly some uh, coming up for this, this next year. So, you know, I think everyone looks at, you know, well, how does this affect my taxes? What about my taxes? And right now, if you look at all services that the town provides, school, community services, the county, the municipal, the, if, you, if you have a house value of 320,000, uh, you, you're getting a bill this week that would be half of, half of this amount. 
but the full year's bill is, is about $5,200. Uh, if you look at the peak year of this stewardship plan, it's, it's, it's 2019. That's when the costs are higher than any other year uh, for, for this plan. And at that point, the tax bill would be $211, or about 4% higher than it is today. The largest single year increase you can see on the little chart at the bottom between 16 and 17, overall taxes would go up 2.2% to begin to Im implement this plan. And then you can see it also defined. So if you look at the, the, the whole overall plan, we're, we're really looking at taking care of our roads, taking care of our buildings, uh, replacing equipment, and you know doing the other stewardship needs for a four percent tax increase over ten years, not each year, over the, the course of the, the ten years. And you know maybe that people feel that's too much, but it's probably fairly within the rate of inflation. And uh, you know I, I, it's it's you know it's not totally daunting to look at it and to consider it, in my opinion. So so where's where's the money going to be spent? This is looking at by object. I put a placeholder in there for a library building. Uh, the placeholder, no secret, it, it, if anyone looks at the plan, it's $5 million. I make very clear that no one has said we're spending $5 million on, on the, the Tosmar Library. However, if I didn't include something for a library in this, everyone would say, well, we, well, we don't know about the library. Uh, you know, the, the numbers don't mean anything. So I had to throw some number in, that's the number I threw in. And it's interesting, if you look at that, that investment in the library building over the next 10 years is only a quarter of, of the, the total investment in stewardship for all the municipal needs. A, a similar amount is for equipment and a little bit is, is for roads. Uh, you know, and the rest is, you know, minor odds and ends of things. You know, if you look at it by, by departments, uh, public works is, is the biggest piece of the pie, 47 percent, and the reason for that is because it's heavy on roads and heavy on equipment. Uh, the fire department, we're beginning to the point we're going to have to replace fire trucks again during this 10-year period. That's why that's, that's 12 percent. Again, the library, it's a quarter of the stewardship cost projected, or the, the overall 21 million uh, over the, uh, the next 10 years. Town Hall, we have some of the same challenges the Town of Falmouth has, if you read that report on air quality and some of the others. So what happens next? You know, the uh, finance chairs, I think, need to look both at the municipal and school needs and report back to their respective bodies. And I think we need to, you know, encourage a public dialogue. You know, we've got the library issue. We've got, you know, all the, the roads and equipment issue. And, you know, it, it does, it would require some additional support for taxes for this. And, uh, it is 4% over the 10 years. In the peak year, it would be a 2% tax increase. Uh, but, you know, to, in my view, it, it's, it, it's a good plan. It, it, it takes care of the stewardship needs. It, it uh, addresses, you know, I think it, it has really looked comprehensively at all that, all that we need to look at. The, the other thing I would like to say is that, as you know, you look at the list, it goes on for pages of, of you know, what was suggested. Th there are going to be changes in individual years. There are going to be things that, that come up that weren't expected, but there's also things on that list that we may be able to extend out or that we may decide not to do. Uh, but, you know, but, but there are things like eventually replacing the turf field that's in there, uh, you know, doing all sorts of other work. Those things you know, are going to take resources, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to folks looking at this and using it as a guide uh, as we look at budgeting for the next 10 years. Happy to answer any questions. Thoughts, Jessica? You have a, an idea for a timeline for your your bullets on the, on, the, on that slide. How how are we? I would defer to Frank on when the finance chairs might meet. Uh, uh, we'll probably be discussing it this week uh, and be meeting early next week. And we've been we've been working with models. Basically, what we're doing uh, the schools will be coming up. And Michael's here if he wants to make any comments. But the schools will be. Coming up, have come up with a plan similar to this. They haven't looked at the financing options since they don't have uh, bonding uh, authority. However, we need to look at that as well, and we'll combine the two. And at the end of the day, the decision what you bond versus what you don't bond is a function of trying to minimize the tax impact and position yourself adequately for you know your debt in the market. 
right yeah, that's right. And I think one important thing I didn't overly emphasize it, but as you're looking, it, we're trying to work with the, with the schools and the whole concept of working together, is that when we're looking at debt for this plan, the proposed eight million dollars, that's totally replacing municipal debt. Right. It's not replacing any school debt. Right. It's only so the schools increase. can look at all their needs independently, look at their debt retirement issues without you know feeling constrained by uh, you know tremendously by what we're doing because it shows what we're we're doing in the debt area is fairly self it's fairly sustaining as opposed to you know a, a big spike. Yeah, I would think the thing that we need to look at is really the timing of these issues as opposed to um, whether or not we're doing anything particular. Yeah. So, can you, uh, John, um, John Christie called me this afternoon as well to just to reinforce the fact, obviously, that he thought Michael would be here tonight, but also wanted to make sure that we understood that he's prepared to call the board together in a joint meeting with us when the time is right for us to dig through this as we had committed to back, if you remember. Uh, several months ago to do that. So, but, yeah. uh, but th th that's true, but w I think we were clear early on that the boards would retain their own authority right, but to do their own reviews and yeah. whatever. So, yeah. you know, so this, there's, there's nothing, there's no specific action being requested this evening is to, other than to acknowledge your seat of the yeah. report. Anything else? No, I guess just, again, to the timing point, um, in terms of process, um, if Michael and I get our work done, say, beginning of next week, what would, you know, I guess, Jim and Mike, what would you see in terms of the, the procedure from there to have an open discussion about this and both of us uh, presenting to our respective boards or joint meeting, whatever, what do you think? Yeah, we got, we've got, uh, in our packet today, we've, we've got a couple of workshops coming up. So, certainly, you know, September, or October, and I mean, the sooner, obviously, the better, um, especially since it would be nice to get a good portion of this work done before there's a new council, because we do have two slots open in this upcoming election. Right. So it'd be good to get this workshop sooner than later, from Absolutely. my perspective. I think, I think as early as we can get the workshop, the better. And uh, we have Mike's numbers, we've got the school's numbers, we're really going to put them together in a way that yeah. is uh, understandable and transparent. Yeah. And, um, and again, as I said, the schools will have their bond, you know, make some assumptions about that, even though they can't issue bonds. Right. So, um, could I have a motion to accept Michael's report? Um, anybody wish to acknowledge receipt? Yeah. Acknowledge receipt? Yeah. I, I move that we acknowledge receipt of the town manager's uh, capital stewardship plan report. And second, uh, Jamie, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Thank you very much, Michael. That was uh, very eye-opening in many ways as well, to just see it laid out in that fashion. Thank you. Uh, seeing no discussion, all those in favor? Six. Zero. Okay, item 110. The chair will entertain a motion for a possible land donation. Anybody wish to make that? Uh, now we have light, Frank. Would you, Dave? Sure. I, I move that we accept the donation of a small lot northwesterly of Stevenson Street off of Spurwick Avenue near the South Portland line. Thank you. A second? Frank, thank you very much. Any discussion? Michael, do you have any background on this that you want to provide to us? No, I, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. This is a landlocked piece right near the South Portland line. The land trust has a it has a has a piece right near it that if you, you saw it on the map there is an orange. Uh, we own a couple of pieces around there. And the thing is, is this land has such no value really to the folks that if you don't accept it, we'll probably take it for taxes uh, anyway. So Conservation Commission looked at it, recommended acceptance, and it'll save us some uh, lien notices and foreclosure notices if you, you accept it. Okay. Any uh, discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor? All those opposed? Six, zero. And the next item on the agenda is 111, the Thomas Jordan Fund. The town manager will present an overview of the finances of the Tom, 
Thomas Jordan Fund, and you moved to a different location. Hey, yeah, well, I was busy cleaning up, so I'm over here now, and my notes are over there, but that's okay. I just wanted to, you know, the numbers are there. I'm not going to repeat them, but the good news is the Thomas Jordan Fund is in very good shape. And it, the, the main reason this is on the agenda, one, is for, for, for transparency to let everyone know about this, but, but secondly, uh, because, you know, the fund is in good shape, it, it's a good time to remind folks who, who are in need in the community of its availability. Uh, if, if you go to the, the town website and you type Thomas Jordan Trust in the search box, uh, or you go to tonight's agenda and you hit the link, it'll bring you to a page that, that gives information about the Thomas Jordan Fund. And it helps out anyone uh, who is within 150% of the federal poverty level. And uh, there's a committee made up of three council members who who are the Grants Committee, they review any grant request over $500. And uh, if folks are going through a particularly tough time and it's not like a general assistance type issue, uh, this is a resource uh, that is available to help out citizens in the community. Thank you. Uh, it is recommended that we acknowledge the receipt of this update. Do I have a uh, motion? Jessica? I so move. Seconded. Frank? Any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor? 6 0. Item 112, a pay classification plan. You see the explanation in front of you about our pay for non union employees. It is recommended that the pay classification plan for 2013 14 be adopted. I have a motion? Motion, anybody? David? Uh, I move that we adopt the pay classification plan for 2013-14 as outlined in our materials. Seconded. Kathy. Good. Any discussion? Michael, any background you want, wish to provide to us? It seems like pretty simple. It just it takes the existing positions and, and increases all the grade levels by 2%. Any questions for the manager relative to this? Jessica. How often is this done, and when was the last done? It's done every year. It's done every year on paper. So it doesn't always come to the council every year, say. but, but we, we go in and manually change it every year. But I was recently looking at some rules or whatever, and in the place, uh, in the personnel code, it says the pay classification plan shall be approved by the town council. So even though you not, you sort of do it when you have your whole budget discussion, okay. but you don't formally do it, and I just thought every so often it's good to bring it before you formally, and uh, that way, uh, you know, again, it uh, reminds everyone that we have a pay classification system and how it works. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those opposed? Six, zero. Item 113, general assistance update. This, Jim, you need to welcome public comment on by state rules. Want it now or after the no. motion? Uh, yeah, anytime. anytime. It's up to, you. up to you. All right. Can I have a motion on this item first? Anybody willing to? <laughs> Working overtime. <laughs> well, uh, nobody else raised their hand. So uh, I uh, move that we adopt the state guidelines uh, for general assistance as a local ordinance. <laughs> for a second on this side. Jamie, thank you. <laughs> um, I'd open this up if there's any uh, member of the public who wishes to address us. Please uh, approach the podium. Give us your name and address. Seeing no one in the audience wishing to do so, we'll move to uh, anybody have any questions about this or? Yes, Jessica. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to remember having dealt with this in the recent past. Are we required to accept the state's guidance uh, the state's recommendations. Yeah. I know some of some of the things we are. I mean, yeah. we, and it's just we're, we do this as a matter of. Yeah. You know, ninety-five percent of the communities do. Yeah. Uh, Ninety-nine percent probably. There are a couple of communities that go off and do their own housing studies. They do their own. Right. Food, you know, survey of food. We we, right. we don't do that. We we're with the the ninety-nine percent that accept the state guidelines. And the state guidelines are looked at for this particular region as well. So it, it is looking at costs for this region, including housing costs. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those opposed? 6-0. 
Item 114, the MMA annual ballot. Uh, Chair will entertain a motion that will authorize the town clerk to cast the annual ballot for the offices of the Maine Municipal Association. Oh, Frank. I want to give David a break. Well, you're not going to nominate me, are you? Yeah, I'm not going to nominate okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> Just move that we uh, authorize the town clerk to cast the annual ballot from officers of the Maine Municipal Association. And a second from that side of the table? Second. Good, Jamie, thank you. Any, any, uh, any, anything you want to offer on this one, Deb? Since you're the person. This would be. Any council planning to attend? I oh, maybe. I probably will since I'm the oh, MMA great. delegate, so okay, good. from the town council. If you insert her name. Uh, great. As the voting delegate, that'd be great. Okay. Any further comments? Doesn't appear to be. All those in favor? Six. All those opposed? Zero. Um, item 115, future council meetings. You've got uh, the representation there in that first paragraph that explains uh, some of the movement. Uh, Monday holidays and a few things in there that have caused this to happen. I don't know whether you've had a chance to look at your own calendars to see if there's any conflicts, but it um, looks pretty straightforward to me. Mm -hmm. Michael and I went back and forth on a little bit. No changes in dates. It's just a different where some was a workshop and a meeting, a meeting is a workshop. But ah. All the dates should already be in your calendars mm -hmm. if you put them in at the beginning of the year. No changes. And do we need a motion to accept the, this, these changes? No. Chair will entertain a motion. Jessica? I move that we uh, approve item number 115, the future council meetings as presented. Seconded? Second. Kathy, thank you. Any questions? Zero. Oh, seven o'clock meetings, right? Same. Yeah, there isn't yeah, a change there. Um, okay, no discussion. All those in favor? Six, all those opposed, zero. The caucus on November 6th could be earlier. Uh, yeah, depends on what. Yeah. All right. Okay, before we go to the, the citizens' discussion, um, Deb wanted to talk to us about an upcoming election. Just wanted to remind everyone that nomination papers for council and school board are still available. The deadline is Friday, September 6th. <clears throat> there are two seats, both in the council and the school board available. Both are, all of those are three-year terms. So anyone interested uh, in filing for either of those positions, please come see me in my office. Again, Friday, September 6th is the deadline, uh, and there is a reminder on the town's website as well. Great, thanks. David, question? I'm, I'm just wondering, has anybody come to take papers out yet? Um, one for school board, not sure if they're going to return them. Uh, otherwise than that, no inquiries to date. So hopefully your announcement will spur some hopefully. candidates. Activity. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is a second opportunity for citizens to discuss items that were not on today's agenda. Are there any citizens who wish to come forward? Seeing none. Uh, item number 116, a request for executive session. Chair will entertain a motion. Tell me who would like to do that. You're on a roll, Frank. So moved. No, you got, well, you, you got to say the statue. You got to stay. 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 Conformance with one MRSA section 405 6F. Seconded? A second. Jessica? Any, um, I guess, no discussion? We, are, we will come back from executive session. Definitely to vote on the poverty issue. Vote on the poverty issue. issue. Yes, okay. All right. Um, all those in favor? All those opposed, 6 0. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. I like it. I am.